We have now for you what I think is going to be a rich 25 minutes. Our second speaker is Dr. David Bouguet, our good Vice Chancellor of Human Resources. Prior to joining us in 2008, Dr. Bouguet was the Vice President at the College of the Desert in Palm Springs. And prior to that, he dedicated many years of his career to community colleges in Michigan. He's here this morning uh, to speak about how to believe in what we do, Dr. David Bouquet. Good morning. Guys, where I come from, somebody says good morning, the proper response is good morning back. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you're good. We're going to talk about how to believe in what you do. I'm one of those people that's kind of an idealist in everything I do. I, I, I was in the private sector for a while. I did rather well, but I found that I like to help people. That's at the core of what I like to do. And I believe that's what we do as a community college. I want to talk about that. Um, and really about three great truths of on community college leadership. Uh, have a conversation with some great faculty. And have some closing comments and a presentation after that. So, so with that, I'm your Vice Chancellor of Human Resources. You don't laugh at this one, but that's me. Uh, but, but here's what we do. We are the first step in the ladder of success for most of our students. I, I really believe that, and, and it, really the core isn't a Vice Chancellor to make that happen. The core of that is our faculty. I, I'm supposed to help you be successful in your classroom. Your deans, your vice presidents, your presidents, everybody in administration, we're nothing, but, we're nothing but glorified support staff to make it happen in the classroom. That's what we're about. Secondly, people come to us, and this is incredible. They pay money, and they ask us to help them become better. Isn't that cool? They're, they come here, and what's the purpose of coming? They want to better themselves in some way, either through education, practical application of the education to the job to make them more successful, but they want to come here, they, they want to be better through knowledge and training. And we're here to provide a life-changing experience. Is that true? Now, now, a lot of times when somebody says that this is yes, and this is no, is that true? Yes, it is. So here's what we do. If Home Depot knows our home improvement stores, then we're a people movement store, aren't we? People come here to get better, and it's part of our job to make that happen. So, so with that, I came upon a great epiphany. The epiphany came at 3.30 in the morning after a night of pizza with everything on it. <clears throat> and, and I'm not certain if it's a divine thing, it may be other based. But anyhow, the first great truth is some of the greatest talent causes some of the greatest anatomical pain. I'll let you define where that takes place at. And it requires extra attention. Is that true? Some of, the, some of the best faculty members can be royal pains. And that's because they're passionate about their subject. Is there anything wrong with that? You, you, you cause gray hairs on more deans than you could possibly imagine. But the truth of the matter is, the bottom line is if you're doing a spectacular job with students, the dean needs to take time, pay attention to what is the end product. Are they doing good in that classroom? Let me tell you about the band dude story. I used to be a principal once upon a time, and then I was a, a public school administrator, and, and I had to deal with a bunch of band dudes, okay? Music people, and I have one, and you're gonna be in a minute, you know how they are, the music people. Anyway, so, so they, they had, we, we had, we had a total of 3,200 students in a K-12 district. They had a program that had 845 of those students in the band program. That's enormous, that's huge. They must have sold it, and by the way, this was not a rich district at all. It was in the blue collar area of Warren, Michigan, and, and the, but their, their job of getting students involved and engaged was spectacular. Every year we had the giant band concert. These guys had zero organizational skills. They, they, they sat there and three days before, oh, we need to have thousands of chairs set up, we need this, we need that. And so I, I got there, this is a tradition for them, the, the, the total chaos. They drove everybody nuts, and especially me, because I had to kind of make it happen. After the second year of this, I got so fed up with them, I was ready to follow them, except for the fact that the truth is, were they doing a spectacular job? 800 odd students out of a 3,000 student district, is that credible? I had to take a step back and say, what can I do to make them more successful? It wasn't my job, by the way, to make them successful. That wasn't my job. 
I sat down with them the next week. We laid out a plan. Let's do this, this, this. Let's say six weeks before, let's do the following. We did the paperwork for the next year before it happened. And when it happened, the third year I was there, in that third year, everything went off almost totally without a, without a glitch. And by the way, that concert was one of the best ones they ever had because all those little garbage little details they couldn't do, they were already done and already planned. I used my skills in organizing to make the band be successful. By the fourth year, it was spectacular. We had the biggest attendance. We had, we had areas set up for, for parents to come take videos of their precious little gems doing their instruments in, in third grade on their little trumpet and everything else, making those screeching sounds. It was a fabulous success. And the program grew even better because of that. Because I took time out to recognize this first truth that some of your best people, some of the greatest talent that you have, need to have a little bit extra love and care. That make sense? Not bad for 3.30 in the morning, right? Second truth, the greatest talents receive attention due to tenacity. They will always get more attention because they're painful. The least talented receive attention due to incompetence. Isn't that true? They get to come visit me. Um, the, 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 the thing I want to focus on is the silent majority. You have a percentage of faculty always up here. You have a percentage always down here. What about that group in the middle? Those are the ones that do a good job every day, but something separates them from being great faculty. And it could be that they might have been great faculty, but they're worn out. If I were a faculty member, and I've been teaching the same classes for 10 years, I had at least a master's degree or better, and I was really excellent because the greatest fear that all people have has been documented multiple times, is not death, it's speaking in front of a crowd. So here we got faculty, they're intelligent, they're publicly articulate, and they're bored. So they pick on administrators. <laughs> I've seen it, it's entertaining. I've even done it a couple times too. So anyway, um, so, so what, what do we do, and how is it possible that we can return them to greatness with the right nudge? I, I'm not certain that's even my role, or if you'd even listen to me if I told you how to do it, because I'm not a faculty member, right? I'm an administrator. So, so that's another thing. Here is an interesting book. Uh, people give me books to read and I read them. Bob Ramucci assigns me homework on a regular basis. Uh, I have a book on tape called Good to Great and, and I heard this quote from Jim Collins. He says, good is the enemy of great. And I thought, what in the world? I rewound it just to make sure they heard it right. And good, if you're doing a good job that's acceptable to you, acceptable to those around you, that separates you from doing that little bit extra to being great. You understand? And, and I can pull the car over and figure this one out. Because of the fact that good is acceptable, everybody thinks it's passable, how can you be great? And here is the third truth. A leader or motivational speaker cannot motivate others to achieve their greatest potential. I've gone to these conferences, and you hear everybody all hyped up. The speaker is spectacular, he's phenomenal. You go back, you're excited for three weeks. After six weeks, you start forgetting because reality caves in, and you're still struggling, and, you're, and nine weeks later, you're back to where you were. I guess I don't believe in motivational speakers. The other part is one can only guide them to believe their own potential. The motivation to become a great talent can only come from within a person. When it comes down to, to can I motivate faculty? Number one, I'm an administrator. I really question the faculty really listen to me about how to do better in the classroom because I'm not there. That's part of it. The other part is, is if the only thing that I could possibly accomplish in a 25 minute presentation is go back and get you to dust off that passion that you started with as a faculty member all those years ago. I don't think that a tenure track faculty member needs much motivation. They're here, they're excited, but it's, it's those people that have been here a while that maybe you were a great faculty member, maybe you did that little bit extra each and every single time, but maybe it's possible you got rusty. Let me give you a clue. If you have the same syllabus for the last 20 years, <coughs> there's a problem. So, so with that,